Okay, so uh, make sure I've got my audio going here. Okay, good. On number 19, we have a stem and leaf display. And uh, down at the bottom of here, this is output from a computer program. It says multiply the stems by 10. So that means that this number is on this side is 10, and we've got 20 on up to 130. And it says the highest value on the data set is. So at the bottom there we have 19. At the top we have, sorry, that should be 130 multiplied by 10. 132. Tom's uh, scores on six tests are, and um, you get these scores says which one is the uh, highest. Well, the mode is the one that occurs the most frequently, and that is uh, 75. So that's the lowest value, so we can eliminate that one right away. And um, you can do this any way you want to, but uh, probably the easiest way is to use your uh, calculator. And what I did was go to my calculator, hit stat, and edit. And then in one of your lists there, it should say L1, L2, L3, and if you arrow over, it goes up to L6. But anyway, just go in that uh, one of those columns. Let's say that you went into column uh, L1. So just then enter the numbers, 95, 80, and just, so just get these numbers in there. And then after that, hit stat again. Then hit calc, and then the first thing under uh, that is one variable statistics. So just select that. You can just hit enter. Um, then since it's option one, you can either hit one or enter. And then on your uh, calculator, you should have a separate line that says one VAR stats. If there's anything before there, then um, you're going to need to go back. You need to hit clear and come, just come back and do the stat calc stuff again. Um, you just needed this need to be on a separate line. Then um, right here, put L1. And if you look on your calculator, if you look at the number one, right up above that, it says L1. And so to get this L1, you just do second. One, And if you do that, you will have an, a mean. It will tell you right there that x bar is equal to 85. And then if you arrow on down, you will see that the median is equal to 84. So the mean is the highest value there. Of course, you could just calculate the mean and the median, put those numbers in order and get the one in the middle or split the difference on since there are six of them. And then, of course, add all those numbers up and divide by six to get the mean. And you would get these same numbers if you did that. Um, it's a little faster, I think, if you use the calculator. Number 21 says, which of the uh, following distributions would have a positive skew? Uh, well, first of all, we can throw out C because the mean and the median are the same. So that means it, everything's going to be in the center. So now the question is, do you have positive skew when you have a mean greater than the median or positive skew when the mean is less than the median? So let's just consider this here. Um, positive skew would look something like that. Well, what would pull it that way would be if you have a high mean because Average is very much affected by uh, an extreme value. So if you have a value up here, or it could be even worse, like a value way over here, like if we were looking at income in Benton County and uh, here you had uh, somebody with a last name Walton, that's going to pull the mean score way up. The median income might be um, 25000 or whatever it is, but the average income in Benton County is going to be like a lot because actually this uh, value is probably way off the screen over there somewhere because, you know, the Waltons make a lot of money.
Okay, so here are some uh, questions that I might ask. In this problem, uh, we have in a random sample, I'm going to just do them down here. Let me go. Okay, so in number one, we have a random sample of 100 Russellville High School students. 54 could name both uh, senators. And then uh, in an independent random sample of uh, 100 uh, adults, 34 could name both senators. By the way, I believe it's, uh, I know David, uh, Mark Pryor's one of them, and I believe Boozman's the other one. Hopefully you know that too. Okay, well anyway. I'm going to do number one here. P hat A, you could put R if you wanted to for high school students. It's just going to be uh, X over N, which is 54 out of 100, which is equal to 0.54. And for adults, P hat B, we're still going to have X over N. That's going to be 34 out of 100, which is 0.34. But what we want to know is the difference between the two proportions. Might be a good idea to start drawing parentheses around there. We're going to come to this difference between proportions again. And I would like for you to start thinking about that as one number. It's just 0.2. So for number two, the average score for Arkansas high school students is uh, 1688. And uh, for a random sample of 100 Georgia high school students, we have uh, 1479. And we're looking for the difference then, so it's just going to be x bar A minus x bar B. Again, I want you to think of that as one number, 1688 minus 1479, and that is equal to 209. So the difference between the two sample means is 209, that's the answer to this one. Number three says, uh, based on your answer to that question, what's the general conclusion that you should uh, make about the quality of education in Arkansas and Georgia? I have to admit this is a, a little bit of a loaded question here. If these were two random, truly, not just, notice it says it's a random sample of Arkansas high school students who took the SAT exam and a randomly selected students from Georgia who took the SAT college entrance exam. So of those who took an exam, it's true. The score is higher in Arkansas than Georgia. The problem is that we're only getting average for students who took the SAT exam. And in Arkansas, most students take the ACT and only, or for the most part only, top students, students who are planning to go to out of school, st out of state schools, maybe Harvard or something like that, only the top students take the SAT. In Georgia, Almost everybody 
takes the SAT. So instead of just the top students, the top maybe 10% uh, taking the SAT, maybe the top 50 or the top 70, anybody who's thinking about going to college. So this really isn't a fair comparison because we're comparing the top per few percent in Arkansas to, almost, to a lot of people in Georgia. So this is really an unfair comparison. Now, if you had said it looks like there's difference, now, this would be like a really good answer. I would, uh, if people know about what's know what's going on and so on, that would be a, a really good answer. Okay, so you're definitely going to get a problem like this, and it's probably going to be worth about, let's say, 20-ish, probably 20 points maybe a couple of points one way or the other. So let's make sure we can do this. Okay, so we're going to get, first of all, the uh, sample means. That means we have to get these sums. And the sums are 40 and 65. So x bar is going to equal the sum of the x's divided by n. 40 divided by 5 is equal to 8. And please make sure that you write down the symbol, the formula, put numbers into the formula, and the solution. y bar then is equal to the sum of the y sub i divided by n which is equal to 65 divided by 5, which is 13. So to get the standard deviations and also the covariance, I usually get actually get the covariance first, and you'll, I, I think I've told you why, and I'll tell you why again. Um, so I'm going to get the deviations. For x, that means I'm subtracting the sample mean from each value. So I'm subtracting 8 from each of these. And that should sum to 0 and does. Now I'm going to get the y deviations, subtracting 13 from each of these. And that should sum to 0 and does. And then I'm going to skip some pace, some space, and get the cross products. Minus 3 times 1 is minus 3. Minus uh, 1 times minus 2 is 2. And so what this is saying is that when, if we look at this row, when x goes 3 below its mean, y went 1 up. In the next row, when x went 1 below its mean, y went 2 below its mean. Next row, when x went 4 above its mean, um, y went 7 above its mean. And in general, except for the first value there, but in general, they're going in the same direction, which would indicate a positive correlation. Um, but we'll get to that calculation in a minute. But they seem to be, generally speaking, moving together. The sum of that column is 87. So I'm going to come down here and do the covariance of x, y. And that's equal to the sum of the x sub i minus x bar times y sub i minus y bar, what I will call the sum of cross products. Divide that by n minus 1. So we're going to have 87 divided by 4. And that's equal to 21.75. So now I'm going to compute the uh, standard deviations. And for that, I need to get squared deviations. Could have done this first before the uh, covariance, but 
at least me, when I have all these columns of numbers, if I do the covariance first, I'm just a little less likely to uh, wander off into the wrong column. So anyway, now I'm going to square these. So the standard deviation of the x's is equal to the square root. Don't forget to take the square root of the x sub i minus x bar squared the sum of squared deviations divided by n minus 1. So that's the square root of 76 over 4, and that's equal to about 4.36. Now I'm going to do the same thing for the y's. I got that sum to be 144. So s for the, s for the y's, the square root of the sum of the squared deviations, that should be a y sub i minus y bar squared over n minus 1. The square root of 144 divided by 4, and that comes out to be 6. So the only thing we have left now is the correlation. I'm going to work that up here at the top here. R, the correlation, is equal to the covariance of x and y divided by the product of the two standard deviations, or 21.75 divided by 4.36 times 6, and that comes out to be 0.83. So that's what we have for part D, 0.83. If on the exam, that number has to be between minus 1 and 1. If on the exam you come up with something else and you can't locate your error anywhere, then um, if you come up with a number that's outside the range of minus 1 and 1, if you indicate that you know that's wrong, then I will look for uh, partial credit. If you don't indicate that, then on Part D, you just won't get any points. Uh, so make sure that you recognize that that has to be between minus 1 and 1. Okay, these are some like on the uh, first homework assignment. I think I've already done that. Okay, so in the first question here, uh, we're writing hypotheses and making up data and uh, uh, getting possible explanations. Um, so is there a linear relationship? Formulate the hypothesis well, since we're talking about linear relationships, we're talking about correlations. So the research hypothesis is that we have a correlation. That means that rho, kind of a side slanted p, is not equal to zero. Present makeup data here. Um, again, I'm just making this stuff, stuff here uh, in a random Sample. I wish I'd just written S or S random for random, simple random sample, so I'd have more space. But in a random sample of 100 um, companies, the correlation between the amount a company spends and sales is 0.72. Again, I just made that, especially the number up here, the rest and the sample size. In a random sample of s some number of companies, the correlation between the two variables is something. Um, 
that could indicate that there is a real correlation or it could just be sampling error. So uh, B says, do more than 20% of Rustville homes have azaleas in the yard? So this is just, a, it's a problem with percentages or proportions. So HR, the parameter is P. Make sure that these are always about your parameters. Your hypotheses will have some combination of rows, P's, and mu's. By combination, I mean you could have PA minus PB or mu A minus mu B. But we want to know if it's the proportion, population proportion is greater than 0.2. So now we say in a simple random sample of uh, let's say 100 Russellville homes, 26 have azaleas in the yard. Again, just made those numbers up, but we'll have that format in a simple random sample of some number of uh, Russellville homes. Some number of them have azaleas in the front yard. That could be that there's a real difference, that is that P really is greater than 0.2. Or it could be sampling error. So what we're getting at here is that always one of the explanations is going to be that there is a real difference or a real correlation or um, and the other is always going to be, the other possible explanation is always going to be that there is sampling error. Okay, so uh, continuing on with this, is the average over 350. Okay. Mu, the population mean, greater than 350. And a simple random sample of, uh, let's say, 100 gas stations. The average price, by the way, this average is X bar. Of course, in the previous problem, the proportion we would have calculated, the 26 out of 100 would have been P hat. Anyway, the average price is uh, 357. That could be an indication that, in, that mu really is greater than 350 or B, it could just be sampling error. Maybe the next time we took a sample, we would get some other number. Number six, in a random sample of 500 Arkansans, 124 indicate they are enthusiastic about the upcoming presidential election. So we're going to compute the sample proportion, and that is just P hat X over N, 124 out of 500 is equal to 0.248. So our sample proportion is 0.248. 
I really didn't want to do that. Okay. So here's a problem where we're just going to identify the uh, characteristics of the problem. And uh, we have a random sample of four customers. And we have the number of times that uh, each has entered the big store in the past month. So an element is one customer. So when we ask someone that, when we get that first three there, we asked one customer how many times they, uh, that person had entered the store in the past month. The response was three. I'm going to skip on down. The population would be then all customers. And the sample is a simple random sample of four customers. The variable is the number of times entered the big store in the past month. Possible values. The values we got were 3, 7, 5, and 5. So obviously those are possible values, but 8, 1, 0, 5, 6 are all possible values that you might have gotten. I guess if we're talking about the big store being Walmart, there's probably people that went in there a hundred times last month. How else would they keep in contact with their friends? Well, anyway, the parameter now is, let me back up a second here. Um, on the variable here, I didn't ask you here, but I could to identify the type of variable. This is not, we're not just putting things in the category, we're actually, I guess, measuring, we're getting actually a how many on this one. Uh, that is a quantitative variable, and this one happens to be discrete. You can't end the store 3.2 times. So that's a discrete variable. And that wasn't asked on this one, but uh, that would be the answer were it asked. The parameter then, since we have a quantitative variable, is going to be mu, the population mean. And the statistic will be x bar, the sample mean. So remember, whenever you're doing the parameter, it's always going to be population something. And it's going to be either mu, p, or rho. And when you say statistic, it's always going to be sample something. And it's either going to be x bar for the sample mean, p hat for the sample proportion, or r for the sample correlation. So this one, we're just going to compute the uh, grade point average. And so to do that, we just need to get the total number of hours in which someone is enrolled in the class. So just the last number there in the um, course number is the total number of hours. If you add that up, you'll get 16. A D is worth one point, and A four, C's are worth two, and B's are worth three. So we want to get 
the points per class. So in that biology class, it was worth four hours, and you four hours, and you got one point um, per hour. So that's four, just multiplying across there. So English, you had three hours of A, which is twelve, then six, six, four, and six, and that adds to thirty-eight. And so the GPA, grade point average, is the total grade points that's the 38 divided by the total hours which is equal to 16 and that comes out to be 2.375 which we would round to 2.38 Okay, so on uh, this problem, um, part A says to uh, get a stem and leaf display and um, let me tell you, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do this. Um, make the numbers come out a little bit better on this. Let me make sure I have all of the, yeah, all the numbers aren't showing there. Okay. To make the numbers come out a little bit nicer, I made that a 34. So what I should say on your uh, sheet. And then I made uh, these last three numbers into 99, 110, and 134. Okay, so that should be all right on your paper, but on this one I hadn't changed it yet. So using stems of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. These are the tens place. So in the, the numbers without any tens are 3, 4, 4, 5, 6, and 8. And then for the tens, it's 14, 15, 19, 19. And then for the twenties, We've got 20, 22, 24, 25, 26, 26, 27, 27, and 29. And I think you've got the idea there. So you can fill that out. Of course, this is going to be 134 down here and 110. Um, and nothing in the hundreds. So we have a 92 and a 99. And you can just fill in the rest of that. Uh, the five number summary. We need the minimum value, Q1, the median, Q3, the third quartile, and the maximum. So the minimum value in the data set is 3. Q1 will be, I have this already divided into the fourth, halfway between the 22 and the 24, or 23. The median will be between 32 and 34, or 33. Q3 will be midway between the 48 and the 50 or 49, and the maximum value is 134. Okay, so uh, a, a box plot with outliers and extreme values. I'm going to draw a straight box plot with 
without being concerned with uh, extreme values and outliers first, let's see if I can fit this all on here. It's not looking good. I was thinking about erasing everything in a minute ago. 120, that's 130. We'll stop there. I know I'm scrunching my number line up, but it'll, it'll work. So uh, draw a box from Q1 to Q3, or from 23 to 49, from Q1 to Q3. Draw a line in the middle that's the median, that's 33. Extend down to the lowest point, which is 3. And extend up to the highest point, which is 134. Okay, on the bottom side, well, let's, on the bottom side, remember to get an outlier, you need to be one and a half boxes away from the, uh, one and a half IQRs away from the box. And the width of the box is, um, is equal to the IQR. So from here to here is IQR. We'll calculate that in a second. Well, I'll go ahead and do it now. IQR is equal to Q3 minus Q1. So that's, uh, 49 minus 23 is equal to 26. Yeah, 26. And um, well, if our if we're at 23 here, 26 would take us even one IQ or would take us below zero. So we don't have to worry about outliers or extreme values on the lower side there, but on the upper side. Outliers are values that are one and a half IQRs from the box, and the edge of the box on the upper side is Q3. So Q3 plus 1.5 IQRs, or 49 plus 1.5 times 26, and that is equal to um, 88. I'm going to put a little circle there to designate that I know that's outliers. And extreme values, so these are outliers. And then extreme values, let me change colors here so you can maybe see a little bit of value better. So extreme values are Q3 plus 3 IQRs, 49 plus 3 times 26, and that's equal to 127. So 134, that's greater than 127, so that's an extreme value. We're going to use an asterisk for that. 110 is not larger than 127, but it is larger than 88, so that's an outlier. And 99 and 92 are also greater than uh, 88, so those are all outliers. And then 61 is the last value that's neither an outlier nor an extreme value. So I'm going to redraw down here. The box is going to be the same. Since there aren't any outliers or extreme values in the bottom, that's going to be the same. I'm going to extend the line here out to 61. That's the last value that's neither an extreme value or an outlier, neither an extreme value nor an outlier. Then I have outliers at 92, 99, and 110. And then I have an extreme value up here that should be at 134. As I noted before, in, at least in the um, classroom here, this tends to be one of the maybe three or four things that are more frequently missed on this exam than others. Not the five number summary, but on the box plot putting on the outliers and the extreme values. So uh, make sure you maybe, if you have to, spend a little bit more time on that.
Okay, so a frequency distribution, a relative frequency distribution, a cumulative frequency distribution, and a cumulative relative frequency distribution. So, first I'm going to do thing I'll do is uh, divide these things up into classes, and you could use different classes than I'm going to use, but I'm going to go ahead and use classes of greater than or equal to zero, but less than ten. And this is uh, I'm just going to put time, the time it takes uh, to hang up on the spiel, and then. Grand equal to 10, but less than 20. Grand they're equal to 20, but less than 30. And I'm just going to keep on with this sequence, hoping that by the time I get to the bottom, I haven't run out of room. This problem, I had changed it from what it was earlier. Class width of 10. I used to have some higher numbers on there. Not letting me write there. Why then? Did that. But then I'm going to just get the frequencies, and that's just to count the number in each class. I'm counting six there. Four in the teens and the twenties. I'm beginning to regret the numbers that I have on here, but oh well. 60s, I've got one. Then in the 90s, I have two, zero in those. In the 100s, there are none. In the 110s, one, zero, one. And I've counted something wrong here.
Oh, okay. I think it's 48. It is. So it was my addition, not my. So relative frequencies. So in the first one, it's 6 out of 48. The next one, 4 out of 48. Then 9 out of 48. I'm going to stop there. You get the idea. Um, I'm going to go ahead and calculate these out. 6 divided by 48 is 0.125. 4 divided by 48 is 0.083. And 9 divided by 48 is 0.1875. You can calculate the rest of those, but I will guarantee that if you added up all of these, you should get one. Then I'm going to get cumulative frequencies, CF, and the first class is going to be less than whatever the first class is, less than zero. So we're going to have zero. Then I'm going to add six. Now I'm in the less than 10 category. There are six numbers less than 10. Then less than 20, I'm going to add another four. So that's 10. Less than 30, add those. And then adding 12, 5, 7. And then I've still got 44, 44. 46, I've added in these two, 46, 47, 47, and then finally 48. And of course that 48 ought to equal the total number of numbers that you had in the whole data set. And I think there were four columns of 12, that's 48. And so then the cumulative relative frequency the first one is going to be less than 10 is 0. Then we're going to add the 0.125. Then we're going to add the 0.083. Get that to be 0.208. Then we're going to add the 1875. 3.955. And if you keep on doing this, when you get down to the bottom, the last number here should be 1. That is 100% of the data are less than 140. Histograms, I think I'm just going to let you do that. Just graph the frequencies here. So you're, well, you can go back and look at your notes at that. That should be pretty simple to do. Just when you get to the relative frequency histogram, all you have to do, I'll remind you that all you have to do is change the y-axis. So in this one, we have a normal population with a mean of 5.8 and a standard deviation of 0.3. We're asked to find from 5.4 to 6.2. So we're looking for all of that area. But remember, we can only go from the mean to some point. So we can get this area, which I will call area A. And we can get this area, which I'll call area B. So for A, 
I find the number of standard deviations from the mean, that's z, the number of standard deviations from the mean, x minus mu over sigma, or 5.4 minus 5.8, and order is important on that, it's the x minus the mean, divided by 0.3, and that is 1.33. And when I look that up in the z value, Z table, I get 4082. So this area right here, from here to here, is 0 0.4082. I'm going to keep repeating this. You can only get areas or probabilities from the mean to some point. I should have put that as ZA. ZB, please write the formula down is 6.2 minus 5.8 over 0.3. I should have set up here that that was minus 1.33. As far as the calculation of area, that doesn't make any difference, but you can see that this 0.5.4 is below uh, the mean. And so this is positive 1.33, which also has an area of 4082. So this is also 4082. So the entire area will be, the sum of those are 0.8164. So in uh, part B, we want to find the probability that we get over six hours. So here's our six over here, probably really over a little bit further to the center, but we're just using this as a guideline here. So I can only get directly this area from the mean to some point. But I also know that from the mean up is 0.5. So once I get that area that I have shaded in green here, I can subtract that area from 0.5 to get the area that I'm looking for, the area that's shaded in red. So z, x minus mu over sigma, is equal to 6 minus 5.8 over 0.3, which is 0.67, and that goes with an area of 0.24 eight, six. I'm going to subtract that from 0.5 and I'm going to get two, five, one, four. Probably sick of me saying this, but make sure you draw a good picture and from there shouldn't be that bad. Okay, this is another one of those things that, again, I'm trying to identify the problems that students had more problems with in the past. And one of those I mentioned was getting, understanding what a rare event meant on the binomial, and then getting the outliers and the extreme values on the box plot. Well, so the other thing is uh, percentiles. Normal distribution, and we're trying to find, in this case, the 10th or the 60th percentile. So, again, normal distribution, start with the picture. And we have a mean, 5.8, standard deviation, 0.3. The 10th percentile, remember the mean is the 50th percentile, so the 10th percentile has to be down here. So that area is 0.1 for the 10th percentile. And again, keep in mind, we can only go from the mean to some point. So this area is 0.4. That's just the 0.5. That's the 50th percentile. Minus the 0.1 is 0.4. Then we go into the center of our Z table and find a number that's close to 0.4, and I believe that the closest number you're going to be able to find is 
look it up. I think it's 0.3997, but I'll make sure. Yes, 3997 is the closest number to 0.4 that you can find. And that 3997, which is close to 0.4, comes out to be, if you look in, back your way out to the Z um, value on the outer rim of the table. Remember on the Z table, the areas are in the center. This is backwards to what we were doing on the previous um, part of this problem. So we started in the center of the table and then backed out to a Z value of 1.28, but it's minus 1.28 just be because we're below the mean. So for this, we're gonna take the mean. Remember, 1.28 is the number of standard deviations from the mean, but it's below the mean. So this just says we are 1.28 standard deviations below the mean. And that comes out to be 5.416. Question D asks for the 60th percentile. So the 60th percentile is going to be over here, 0.6 from this point down, we're looking for this value of x. We know from here down is 0.5, so that leaves 0.1 as the area in here. Remember, we can just go from the mean to some other point. Probably getting sick of hearing me say that. And if you look up 0.1 in the center of the table, the closest number you're going to get is 0 0.0987. And that goes with a Z value of 0.25. So Z is equal to 0.25. So this just means we're 0.25 standard deviations above the mean. Okay, so uh, we're looking at a potential customer who leaves the uh, big store with a shopping cart, goes on to put it in the cart, that probability is 0.7. Um, so they either do or they don't put the uh, cart in the corral um, and a random sample of six. So we know that um, if we sample six people that either zero, one, two, three, four, five, or six people are going to return the cart, which would be, by the way, the polite thing to do. And then we can go to the binomial table and look up probabilities associated with each of those. and I'm just copying these down from the binomial table. Of course, that should sum to one or maybe might be a little rounding error out in the 10 thousandths place, but. Okay, so the graph then I'm going to offset that zero. In this case, it's not going to make much difference because the probability is so small. So 
So for zero, not much there. For one, we have a probability of about 0.01. For two, 0.06 almost. For three, 18.52. For four, 32.41. For five, 0.3025. And then a 0 0.17, 0 0.1176. So that's just a graph of this probability distribution over here. So in a random sample of six, what's the probability that at least one returns the cart? So at least one would include all of those. So we would just sum all of these probabilities, or more easily, we can take one minus since all of the sum of all that is one, one minus point zero zero seven, that's point nine 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 three. So is that uh, result surprising? No. We'd almost get almost always we'd almost always get at least one. The probability is 0.9993. Okay, so the next one uh, is going to say fewer than one. I'm going to go ahead and circle that now and then come down and refer to it. Fewer than one is just zero or 0 0.0007. In fact, I'm just going to answer this right on this uh, sheet right here. So uh, the answer to D was 0 0.0007. And the next part says, is that result surprising? So on part E, the answer is yes. If P is equal to 0.7, so if this 0.7 really is true, look at this just like our uh, uh, mythical fair coin that we've, I've been talking about from time to time. If you flipped a coin, I'm just going to repeat what I've said before before I continue on in this problem. If you flip a coin 10 times and you get 10 heads, you're probably going to think that the coin isn't fair. So I want you to look at this binomial and think of this probability right here as what we might define as a fair coin, that it's 0.7. So now if we think that P is 0.7, that that's what would be the fair coin or what we're uh, proposing there at the uh, top end, then obtaining fewer than one would almost never happen. The probability is that 0 0.0007 probability. Therefore, I doubt P really is equal to 0.7. So it's just like if you had the coin, you think it's 0.5, and if it were, you'd almost never get 10 heads in a row. But if so, if you did get the 10 heads in a row, in this case, if we did get fewer than one, then you doubt the validity of that original statement that the coin was fair that it was 0.5, or in this case, the original statement being that the probability of putting something in the corral is uh, 0.7. Think about this more just from a logical standpoint. If someone tells you that 70% put it in the corral, and you go out and look at some uh, six randomly selected times, and of the six customers you watch at random, you have, would have to have some form of randomization, only that none of them put it in there, then you might think it's a bit of a stretch to think that 70%. It looks like it's a lot less than that. Okay, so uh, this is stuff about the uh, from the lecture, the last lecture I have on there, which 
actually this test is going to be posted before I get to this lecture, but I will be uh, putting a short, maybe uh, maybe maybe a 10-minute lecture um, out there on the on these kind of issues. Um, what we have right here is um, most of the points. That was good. Well, I was hoping I'd get that stuff back. Most of the points are, and this look like a line up there, but you've got one point down here. And look at this correlation, minus 0.5. It's really, when you compute it, it's looking like really the line is like that. That's all because of this one point that is out, is different from its, uh, all of the rest of our values are, have x's around here, but x, the x value is way off down here. That's called an influential point. In fact, your answer to number 14 should be this line, the one with the downward slope. That's what a computer is going to draw in that case. Um, let me go on and say that uh, if we didn't have that point, if we had had you know, all those original points like that, and then we had one point like this that's a little out of whack, this point is not an extreme value. It's in our same range, range of x's. It's just a little bit off the line, line. That one would be called an outlier. And though it would have more effect on the line than other points, it's not going to take it down like this. It's just going to move from this to maybe something like that. So it does kind of skew the results, but not as dramatic as an influential point. Okay, so the last one here, I'm pretty sure this is the last one. Um, this is another one of the uh, applets that are, um, that are posted on Blackboard and that will, will be on a video. Uh, what this is saying is that all of our observations are for x's in this range, but there really are values of x over this whole thing. And if you look at all of the x's, it looks like the line has an upward slope looking something like that. But because we only select this range like here, the values are like that, and the line that we're going to get is something like that. What this stresses is that if you're studying a particular variable, that if you really want to know the relationship, you have to make sure that you encapsulate the whole range, I wish they had called it domain, the whole range or domain of x's in which you might be um, interested or in which there would be a relationship between these two variables, these, this x and this y. So you need to think ahead of time. That's really the same or a possible explanation up here in this. This could be an issue of restriction of range. It may be that if you had more observations up here that you would get that's possible. That's not the only thing. This just could be an unusual point. Maybe um, something was odd that day that caused a different kind of uh, um, something unique that would cause that point to be down there. Uh, that could be just a, a misentered data value in your data set, for example, or it could be some other uh, thing. Be careful, though, to not just throw that point out example I've used and it's been used in a lot of places is a graph that looked like this and did have an influential point up here. Uh, what happened in the case I'm going to describe to you is that that point was in essence ignored as far as decisions as the decision making process uh, was, um, it was just ignored in the decision making process. 
But that wasn't the right thing to do because this axis was temperature and this axis was number of O-ring failures. And in 1986, we launched a space shuttle and um, we actually <laughs> did it at a temperature down here. And by ignoring this point that we had, what we ignored was the effect of temperature on failures of O-rings. And so launching down here, uh, the O-rings failed, fuel went into a place it shouldn't have, and uh, the Challenger exploded, killing seven people. So it could be a pretty serious thing just to uh, ignore a point. Okay, I was wrong. There is one more question on here I'd forgotten about. This is another one of those applets that I put on there. And uh, it asks you to, uh, this is you know one of the graphs that was on there, to explain the, um, the squares in this graph to the calculation of standard deviation. So I'm going to write down some of the stuff that you do when you calculate standard deviation. You have your individual values, you get the sum of those values, and then the average for the sample is the sum of those values divided by n. And let's, I'm just going to put a couple of values, let's say that that was 8 and that was 12, and that that came out to be 10. It doesn't, but let's just say that it did. In fact, that doesn't match up with these. Uh, let's say that this came out to be 60 and this was uh, 58 and uh, 72. And of course there'd be some other numbers in there as well. So anyway, we're going to have another column. These are deviations. And if we just had one of these lines like that, or one like this, that's a deviation. The difference between a, a specific value of x and the mean. So here we would have minus 2, and here we would have 12 if those were numbers on there. Deviations from the mean. But remember, we squared those deviations. And you know when you square a deviation, you make it geometrically into a square. So we have 4 and 144. And so we come down here and we get the sum of everything in that column. And let's say that that came out to be uh, 292. Making that number up. But what this is, is the area, let's say the total area of all of the squares. And so geometrically, that's what this, this is, is the sum of the area of all of those squares depicted in that picture. Now I'm done.